to the panel for its ELIT's number one hit. One of the things that preoccupies us and motivates us, come on in, have a seat. Uh, some, one of the things that motivates us and preoccupies us about where we're headed with electronic literature is its reach. How it might go mainstream, how it might have its important, uh, you know, break into the mainstream, have a number one hit, have something that gains a, a, a high level of recognition, not just popularity, of course, but quality. So I will begin with a presentation, followed by, is it Kathy? Kathy Inman Behrens and Lyle Skanes. We're gonna be exploring a number of phenomena. Uh, I will set a conceptual framework of what I call third generation electronic literature and they will look at more specific cases of phenomena within what I would call a third generation electronic literature uh, whether it's a concept that sticks is up to the community uh, so let's see if I can pitch it all right let's get started so so let's just start with a, a baseline, broad definition, working definition that I use. I, I define electronic literature as language-centered art that engages the expressive potential of electronic and digital media. I really go down to the basics of literature as the art of writing, the art of literacy, the art of language, right? So language needs to be a key component this is one of those dividing lines between video games and literature. Uh, I think there needs to be an artistic engagement of language. So even though code, the underlying code uh, that powers a video game is language, we were having a conversation about that, it is being engaged functionally and not artistically. So we have a lot of multimedia as digital media brings together, turns everything into ones and zeros and matches them. There's all sorts of feedback loops and input devices that can lead to interactivity, user interactivity. Uh, we're not talking the mental interactivity of, of decoding a work with your brain. We're talking about actually going through the machine in some way. Computation, generative literature, etc. We have seats up front, come on over. Uh, networking and digital culture itself. Uh, we've had enough of that going around that it becomes, it, it gains its own critical mass. Now, historicizing electronic literature, the first efforts towards historicizing electronic literature were done by Kate Hales, uh, Electronic Literature, What Is It?, and other publications. She first established the concept of first generation electronic literature. Come on in, we have seats up front. Uh, and she defined it as pre-web, text-heavy, link-driven, uh, very texty hypertext, and, uh, and still not too far from print paradigms, right? She defined a second generation. She, she defined it from 1995 onwards, a second generation with the web, and uh, she later renamed after you know, some of the critical conversation around it, she renamed first generation and second generation as classic and contemporary electronic literature. Along the way, with the research that gets done in the field, Chris Funkhauser, Prehistoric Digital Poetry, elaborated those notions, especially of first generation, and showed that it wasn't just texty, it, it also had multimedia, it also had animation, he explored, and, and others have explored, the richness of that first generation. So here's what I'm proposing. Updating the historical model, leaving behind classic and contemporary distinctions. Problem with contemporary is, is, is open-ended, right? What's called contemporary, right? you have to keep adapting it. And defining three generations, or waves, if you will, of electronic literature. The first one, much as defined by my predecessors, pre-web experimentation with electronic and digital media. Second generation, 
again, the web to the present. Uh, it, it's not over. Uh, don't be alarmed. Uh, if your work falls within what I would call second generation, it's alive and kicking. Uh, innovative works created with custom interfaces and forms. I'll elaborate on that. And a third generation, around 2005 to the present, uses established platforms with massive user bases. We're talking about the emergence of social media networks, of touchscreen devices as popular platforms for uh, production, sales, and consumption of work, right? So the first generation, and I'm gonna do, kind of unpack all three generations here, the production was limited, right? I mean, people had limited access to the materials. The number of practitioners was fairly small, uh, dozens, you know, maybe hundreds, programmers in universities and private industry, producers of film, television, radio studios that had access to the material to, you know, they were expensive tools. And as the personal computer came in and popularized access to computing, then you have programming enthusiasts with personal computers, and, uh, and that is the beginning of the explosion. Now, the tools were very limited, specialized computers, you know, required entire rooms and a lot of infrastructure. Programming languages, uh, you know, initially punch cards, but very close to machine language kinds of programming languages that become easier as we come along, right? With BASIC and Pascal, they try to be a little uh, closer to natural language. Software, you have some of the early software for development, then HyperCard, StorySpace, Inform, that came a little later, but powerful tools and, and really responsible for a lot of the, of the production. And distribution mostly happened in physical media, discs uh, circulated or, or circulated through the print establishment. Now, the audience was limited. Story space had good success in getting national attention. Interactive fiction, if you consider that electronic literature, and I do, uh, had a, you know, had a boom. Now the second generation, this is growing, right? People have personal computers, you have thousands of works, you have a growing number of practitioners in the thousands. We, in general, the kinds of people that are producing things are programmers with personal computers, web artists and developers, writers and artists collaborating with programmers, and multimedia authoring software users. Flash, for example, empowered a whole generation to produce wonderful works of electronic literature. And other tools like that, director uh, did so earlier. So the tools are more varied, there are many, uh, and they continue, remember, this generation isn't over. So digital media all over the place, programming languages, right? We have the first versions of HTML and JavaScript and CSS and DHTML and ActionScript and all these things, and then we get the sort of more mature, more usable Python and Ruby and their variations. Software, this was the period especially, which has come to an end, of Flash and Director, but the second generation work continues in other authoring software. Um, throughout all this, editing software for audio, video images is a constant, right? Distribution, Distribution, you can see I'm adapting this from a Spanish version. <laughs> web, app stores, and physical media. But web is the main one. I was having a conversation with Nick Monfort uh, yesterday about precisely how we could say this is the web generation and that maybe the third generation is post-web because the web is not necessary to deliver this. Post web, and we have a book called Post Web with Alexandra Saun. That, so read it, and you'll know what what we're talking about here. The audience is growing, and academia has been a big engine for spreading this audience. Classes, uh, presentations, exhibitions, conferences. Uh, it's it's growing nicely. Now, third generation, the production or the producción is massive. <laughs> thousands and thousands and thousands of work. Millions if you count like image macro memes, which I do, so I'll just say millions, but we'll, we'll get to that. 
The number of practitioners, large, thousands. Millions if you count image macro memes, right? <laughs> Again, uh, which, which I do, sort of, right? It's, 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 well, I'll get to that. So, yes, we have programmers, designers, digital product, people who have real like skills in programming and, and, and digital production producing third generation works, as well as second generation works. There's some crossover. But the users of multimedia authoring software, I'm talking Instagram, I'm talking Snapchat, I'm talking all of these apps that suddenly allow you to throw language, take a picture, put language in it, create an animation and share it. Uh, they are doing something. They have stepped away from the page into Elit's territory. And I think it's an important move. Now, so all of these users of apps and social media networks and the tools that are placed at their disposal, they are producing what I call third generation electronic literature. The tools are many and varied. I'll just point out that we have lots of apps. We have works, we have platforms like software like Twine and Unity, Cheatbot done quick. Uh, last, I got a number, there's over 7,000 bots active right now using Cheatbot done quick publishing, <laughs> generating, and Twitter. And of course, we have a lot of API services, which kind of come, really start emerging mid 2005, et cetera. So, so it's this connectedness, right? The distribution is happening through web, through apps, through social networks, and the audience is massive, <coughs> massive. I'll give you a sense of scale in a bit. So, some of the genres that emerge in the first generation, chatbots, Eliza with generative texts, some of these we're familiar with. The second generation really kind of brings electronic poetry into, into uh, the four. Hypertext continues, we always have installations that kind of cuts across generations, virtual reality, augmented reality, all of these wonderful things. Third generation. Again, we have twine games and social media bots and Instagram poetry. So we're getting, it's not like it's entirely new genres. They've just come around to some of the established genres, but are doing it in a third generation kind of way. Example with bots. So first generation, Eliza, Joseph Weizenbaum, 1964, MIT. Uh, you know, you have to go to MIT, you have to sit at the machine, you have to interact with Eliza and, and do the Turing test if you wanted to, or if you knew you could just interact with it. Very limited, right? But of course, uh, in terms of audience and distribution, you have to go to it, right? Um, second generation, Galatea, uh, Facade, right? They create these sort of interactive fiction or game environments, and they create an interface for you to interact with these bots that exist within this particular standalone work, right? But you could access them on the web. Twitter bots. There's a number of different techniques, some of, of creating a ton of different techniques for creating Twitter bots. Uh, but the idea is that they are generating, they are bots. They are these sort of human-like or concept-like personified machines that are tweeting on social media and can be interactive. However, um, so you're on Twitter and the bots come to you or you follow the bots or someone liked something that a bot said or retweeted and next thing you know, art is getting in the way of the, you know, <laughs> bad news and abuse that, <laughs> that happened on Twitter. All right, cheap bots done quick is a big engine for that because it's super easy. Kinetic works, I'm gonna blaze through some of these so I can get to the big concepts at the end, but we can see Roda Lume by Melo Castro needed a, a TV production studio to help produce this work. Uh, now by Eduardo Cax on the LED screens, First screening in BASIC. Uh, the struggle continues by Young Hee Chang Heavy Industries. 
hearts and minds, com you know, generative and, and, and immersive video works. We have El Poema Que Cruzó el Atlántico by Maria Mencia that mm. also has the animated text, I believe created with processing, is it? Maria, no? no? It's um, Java. Java, all right. Um, yeah. And we have kinetic typography, in which you have, in games, you know, you're they're writing on video, they're writing on space. The the language is is taking a a, a poetic, functional but also poetic space on the on the video surface on the game surface. So examples of third generation ELIT, that is one that you just saw. Mm -hmm. Alan Bigelow is an interesting example because he starts as a second generation one, and when he leaves Flash behind, he moves into a third generation set of poetics. Really, uh, this piece, How to Rob a Bank, which won the, the, the Cooper Award last year uh, for best work of ELIT, is a slideshow. All you do is advance. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't, there's no need for instructions. There's no need for inventing an interface, as he did in his earlier works in Flash. <laughs> Twine games take hypertext into a very popular uh, form. Remixes taking, you know, Nick Monfort mm -hmm. creates Taroko Gorge, but those who remix are not reinventing a form, they're adapting and appropriating and erasing. Twitter bots you've heard of, Netprov, right? It's a kind of graffiti in social media spaces as a performance in social media spaces. Performances, just taking on a character. Um, the virtual environments that, that Andy Campbell, Mez Breeze, Christine Wilkes, and others are creating for established platforms like the Oculus Rift. Metamorphobet for kids on iPads. Tender claws, again, nobody needs to learn how to swipe. The, the language, the vocabulary of interaction is all there. Also an award-winning work. Jason Edward Lewis comes from a sort of second generation do-it-yourself thing, and, and, and initially these works, he's taking touchscreen technologies before they were really established, but then he does the app. So again, a bridge case. Image macros, you know, I like to think of image macro memes as a sort of gateway drug into ELIT. <laughs> they're, they're taking a step away from the page, they're writing on images, sometimes moving images, and that alone is a step in the right direction, and hopefully it leads to further exploration. Instagram poetry, uh, you'll be hearing more about this, but Rupi Kaur, uh, has massively best-selling books because she has a massive audience on Instagram. And Lazy Cat by Tech Stories has over 66 million views. So let's enjoy this together real quick. I don't know if you've seen it, but if not, here it comes. Let me see. I'm cutting off the sound. It's really the sounds of gesture, but. Thank <laughs> you. 
the idea, right? This is, as, as, if we were to think of this in terms of second generation work, this is not a particularly technically sophisticated work, right? It's, it's a video. It was produced using some sort of messaging software and screen capture. Uh, you know, this is not groundbreaking. However, it's very popular. It's mm -hmm. funny. It's effective. It's it, it's quite smart in how it uses the very limited language that they have at their disposal, all caps, lowercase, tactical use of punctuation, hashtags. It's, it's very aware of its vocabulary and it uses it effectively. And, and of course it leverages cat culture to uh, you know, become massively popular. Uh, I think it's a, it's a really great example of what a third generation work would be like and, and what we might learn from that. So we have these two coexisting generations. The second generation seeks originality and formal innovation, while third generation is building upon existing forms. The second generation builds and adapts interfaces for works. Third generation adopts what's existing. In the second generation, readers must learn how to operate works. Uh, Eli Cortega is doing, a, is doing research on instructions, right? Yes. For works of electronic literature. Uh, not an uncommon phenomenon, right? And also in a lot of the criticism, books about electronic literature, there's all this like, here's how you read a work of Eli. Here's how you, you know, this is the attitude you need to have. Here, readers are already familiar. In second gen, audiences go to the work, you build a website, people go to it. Here, they circulate where the audiences already are, Twitter, et cetera. And I think the biggest kind of philosophical difference is that the second generation has this modernist experimental poetics. Make it new, make it difficult, make it international, to, to quote uh, academic in, in, in some cases. Third generation is more postmodernist, but not the really intellectual postmodernist. It's more like the, you know, remakes, pastiche, ready-made. There's no originality, only, you know, copying and reinvention, adaptations. And it's very connected to pop culture, to internet culture, to fandom. Okay. Now, and I'm wrapping this up. Part of what is important about all this is that both on an individual level and a societal level, there's these phases of electronic literature adoption. I would say first is approach. When you have things like Borges imagining hypertext and other works, right? Pre-digital, pre-online things that are choose your own adventure books, things like that, right? That they're reaching for the concept. Discovery, aha! Many of you may have a, an Elit origin story. If we're superheroes, <laughs> we have a, like an aha moment when we realize this is what this media can do. This is its potential. And we just got hooked and started exploring, right? And that exploration, in a lot of Elit writers' works, there's this phase of almost proofs of concept, short works. If you think of Belen Gachet's word toys. It's a, basically a compilation wrapping the virtual cover around a series of little short elit pieces exploring concept. And then that exploration leads to maturity and you know really developing one's own voice. The final step, adoption. That's widespread. That's things becoming recognizable at a societal level. So the elit, the digitality, 
the, the, the materiality starts to fade and it feels natural. And I think that's where you have a little bit of a generational difference in terms of, you know, if you look at the authorship of third generation works of Elit, they are a younger generation who have naturalized a lot of this. We grew up, many of us grew up at a time where, you know, you could see the materials, you could see the code popping through, right? And to mind the gap, these are my final words, six fallacies, because there's always a gap between what I say and what is understood, and I want to make some clarifications. <laughs> The explorer fallacy. So to be pioneering doesn't necessarily make a work high quality. Interesting, yes, right? But, but not necessarily good. The generational fallacy. The most recent generation does not mean it's better. Actually, in most cases, it's, it's worse. <laughs> but it doesn't matter, right? Because they have numbers on their side. You know, Sturgeon's law that 80% of all science fiction is crap, but then again, 80% of everything is crap. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, I don't want to offend anyone, but we need to get our failures out to get to the really good stuff, right? And so anyways, they have numbers on their sides. Something is gonna come through from all this bubbling production. The viral fallacy, just because it's super popular doesn't mean it's good. Lazy Cat is fun, uh, you know, it's, it's, I don't know if it'll stand the test of time, but it's, a, it's an interesting early piece that is very popular. The technical fallacy, technical complexity does not equal quality. And that, you know, sometimes we find ourselves talking about the works on a technical level and you know, it's interesting, but maybe not so good, but it's interesting, so, you know. And the hipster fallacy, <laughs> made from scratch, does not equal quality uh, either, whether you, you're using a, a highly polished product that gives you a limited vocabulary or you're building it from scratch, again. And finally, the user fallacy, if it's made with an app, it's sort of the opposite of the hipster fallacy. Oh, this is just a user, that what they're doing in, in Snapchat is not interesting. Well, at some point, someone is gonna break through with something really quality. And I hope we're paying attention so we can notice. Thank you.